Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our special summer episode of Dine Around Downtown, Cooking at Home Edition. If you are new to the program and have not seen any of our previous episodes and would like to, you can check them out on our website at downtowny.com slash dineround. Now, my name is Ron Dijon. I am the event manager at the Downtown Alliance. We are a business improvement district for Lower Manhattan, striving to help make downtown a cleaner, safer, and more vibrant place to work, live, and visit. And the, one of the ways we do that is by providing support to local businesses. We began Dine Around Downtown Cooking at Home Edition in June of 2020, during the height of the pandemic. And it has been part of our continuing efforts to provide support to local restaurants and food security charities that have been impacted by COVID-19. Today, our featured restaurant has chosen the Barrio Fridge as their food security charity. To learn more about the organization and how you can donate, visit thebarriofridge.com. For, uh, and for your convenience, I did place that in the chat box as well, okay? Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we officially begin. We want to let you know that this cooking demo is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out tomorrow via email to everyone who signed up for the episode. During the demo, if you have any questions or, uh, well, any questions or comments for our guest chef or our host, uh, please submit them by using the Q&A feature. For those of you on a desktop or laptop, this is usually located at the bottom of your screen. If you are using a mobile device, such as a phone, iPad, or tablet, you can tap your screen once, and depending on the device, it will appear, I believe, on the top right corner or at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and again, it just says Q&A, so that should be easy to find. Uh, now, the chat box itself, we will reserve for us to help share helpful links and other de detailed information with you throughout the program. One more thing I did want to mention was our poster plate contest. And I'm going to share that in the chat box as well. If you are following along and cooking at home, either today or perhaps over the weekend, you can win a 30 minute private virtual cooking class with tonight's guest chef by simply posting your plate on Instagram using hashtag dine around at home and tagging at downtown NYC. So check out the chat box for more details on that. And uh, please share all your photos and masterpieces. We'd love to see it. Um, okay, so I believe that's everything on my end. Uh, Without further ado, I do want to introduce our fabulous host, uh, Rocco Despiro. Despirito. <laughs> Rocco, I butchered your name. Rocco Despirito. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ron, how, are you doing? how many episodes? On? How many episodes have we done? I'm butchering uh, your you name. You know, we've done. It's been Came two years, you. Ron. This is very <laughs> exciting stuff. <laughs> This has lasted longer than most of my relationships, and I'm including family here. So this is great. This is great. Um, you guys, you. Uh, people out there watching, you have no idea how hard uh, Ron, Dijon, and Craig, and Shelly are working on this stuff. Behind the scenes, is there is a, a mountain of work that goes on to produce this, finding the chef, getting the chef set up, you know, making sure the dates are right, making sure the content is right, make sure it's well researched. I know you guys appreciate it already. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that the team behind the scenes is doing a great job and really, really working hard and that the Downtown Alliance continues to be super focused on uh, making our lives as fun and delicious as it possibly can be in the downtown area all below Chambers Street. Um, I'm a proud resident. Uh, if you guys read the four questions for Rocco Spirito article recently published on the Downtown Alliance uh, blog or vlog, you'll know that I'm a downtown, longtime downtown resident and proud to be. And if you guys came to the, the in-person diner around, you know how much fun we had and how exciting it was to see all of you in person. I, I, you know, I said in the article that the joy was palpable, the pent up demand was palpable, the, uh, the plaza was just brilliant with activity and, and happiness and delicious smells. And I, I can't wait to, to do it again with you guys. In fact, at the end of this, I'll tell you about the next event that we have coming up. But today we get to talk about one of my favorite and one of the most debated topics in all of cooking dumb. The lobster roll has been the source of pleasure for many people and great debate for many, many chefs and their partners. And uh, today joining us, we have the, uh, the Duke of Luke's Lobster, uh, Ben Conniff, Chef Ben Conniff, coming to you live from Portland, Maine. What's up, Ben? How are you? I'm nice great. How are you, Rocco? I'm great. You know, we were talking about this earlier that um, 
how we get lobster meat and how it's processed and how it's cooked and how it's handled, whether it's served hot or cold are all huge sources of debate. And, uh, you know, chefs and their partners and chefs and restaurateurs to talk about this endlessly. Well, today you get to settle all the debates. Uh, you know, lobster roll is probably one of the most fetishized foods in the world. Uh, it's just lobster meat on a bun, but boy, does it cause a lot of uh, heartache and debate. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad we have you. Luke's Lobster is an icon. Started out as a cozy little shack in the East Village, became a food truck. We'll talk a little bit about the joys of running a food truck in New York City. And then, of course, went on to uh, open multiple locations all over the place, not just in New York City. Ben is here. He's going to teach us how to make the uh, one, the only, the lobster roll and uh, tell us all about how they got started. Ben, what's going on, brother? Not too much. Enjoying myself up here in Portland, Maine. Uh, it's, so uh, you're in Portland, it's... Maine in July, August. Is, there is no better place or time than Portland, Maine in July, August. Am I wrong about that? I, I think that's a fair assessment. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Yeah. All my friends who are in Maine right now uh, who text me pictures of these vistas and blue water are making me very jealous. I'm upset yeah. I can't be with them, but thank you for coming to us live from Portland, Maine to show us how to make the lobster roll. Tell me, tell me all about it. Tell me about how you guys got started and uh, the fact yeah. that you've been doing this for 12 years and you look like you're, you're 18. So we need to know everything. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty zoomed no out details. here. That, I think that explains that. But um, so we have, we've been doing this for 13 years now. Uh, and the genesis of Luke's, it, it starts not with me, not even with Luke, but with Luke's grandfather, who was a lobsterman decades ago, uh, and then Luke's father, who was a lobsterman, and then became the first lobster processor in the state of Maine. And what that means, is not, it's not what you think of when you think processed food. It basically means taking live lobster, all of the lobster that wouldn't get sold into the live market, because there's actually not enough demand in the live lobster market for all the lobster that gets sustainably caught. And so lobster processors take that live lobster and they cook it and they make either cook, cooked meat or other value add products with it. And that's what allows us to keep giving fair prices to fishermen as they go out there and sustainably fish that growing catch. So Luke's dad was the first lobster processor in Maine. Uh, Luke lobstered when he was in high school and college. And then he was told by his parents that they weren't helping to pay him, uh, pay for his college education so that he could go be a lobsterman because he wouldn't need that education to do that. So. Uh, they convinced him to take a finance job for a couple of years after college, but he was only two years into that job before he sorely missed home and missed his home industry uh, and missed having a good lobster roll because he went all around New York City, couldn't find a lobster roll that reminded him of home. So he put together this business idea that he could get the world's best lobster meat from his dad's company, get it down to New York at a more affordable price with no middlemen. And he could put it in a bun in a casual setting and treat people the way they wanted to be treated. And that would be the most authentic main lobster roll experience that you could get in a place like New York. So and the rest is history. And there's so much, there's so much to talk about that's come from there. But I want you to take a moment and tell us a little bit about what it's like to witness. I know you're the co-founder, but my, to my understanding, you, you didn't start out life as a lobsterman. Please give us a little bit of paint a picture. What's it like to be a lobsterman? We've seen the movies. I know. I know there's sort of a cowboy esque lore about being a Maine lobsterman. I think Billy Joel wrote a song about it. Uh, you got to give us a little bit of insider's guide to being a lobsterman and living that lobsterman life. Yeah. So the Maine lobster industry is really unique, and one of the things I love most about it is it's an owner operated fishery. So when you think about seafood industry generally, a lot of different types of seafood, basically a big company can buy up all the boats and then be the boss of the fishermen, tell them when to fish, what to fish for, and what to do. That's not the case in the main lobster industry. To go out and fish for lobster, it's one boat, one license holder, and that license holder has to be on the boat at all times. They own their own business. So lobstermen are their own entrepreneurs, they decide when to get up in the morning, when to go out and fish, where to go, what to do. They bring their catch in. And then every day we compete to convince those lobstermen that we're the, we're the folks they should sell their lobster to. So it's not an easy job. You're going out there in all kinds of weather. You're getting up super early in the morning. You're doing very hard physical work. But it's a beautiful job in that you're out there in nature and you are your own boss. 
and you're going out there and you're making what really for generations have been very sustainable fishing decisions. Lobstermen were out there coming up with the rules for sustainability to keep their catch thriving and growing before sustainability was ever a word that anyone uttered in a restaurant. So I mean, there was, a, there was a time where there was a massive main lobster shortage, wasn't there? We're talking, yeah. I think, 80s, 90s, and then the, the industry took a pause, recovered. That's all thanks to the, the new sustainability practices that were enlisted by Maine Lobstermen. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's thanks to you guys. That, that is exactly right. They stepped in. They said, we got to stop catching undersized lobsters. We got to stop catching oversized lobsters. We got to stop catching breeders. We have to mark the breeders. So many new things that came in. Okay, in that get, era. you started throwing out jargon. I'm going to have to interrupt you. I hate to sound rude, but breeders are lobster whips. So generally, um, I might mean two things. So, so lobster is actually carrying eggs. So a female right. lobster with eggs right. under her tail uh -huh. yeah. when you catch her. But unlike other fisheries, not only do you throw her back, but you actually put a notch mark in one of her tail flippers so that mm -hmm. she's caught later, even if she doesn't have eggs she's marked as a good breeder. So she still gets thrown back anyway if she has that mark in her tail. That's a signature of the main lobster industry that you don't really find elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so if you guys have ever seen it, if you haven't been uh, fishing for lobster or on a lobster boat, you probably haven't seen it, but the tail um, has thousands of eggs on it. It's a really an incredible sight. Look it up, Google it, it's pretty cool. And they're treated as sacred for obvious reasons. Uh, I also know that when I was in, whenever I've spent time in Maine, if we ever got close to lobster traps, you know, people, I guess you guys own your own lobster traps. If we ever got close to them, we were told, do not touch them, do not get near them. They are basically off limits. You, you could be shot on sight. Tell us the truth about that. Yeah, so every lobsterman has their own buoy colored pattern. So that trap is sitting down at the bottom of the ocean, but there's a buoy floating that they paint their own patterns so they know exactly which traps are theirs and you don't want to be the person that's reaching down and grabbing somebody's buoy and pulling their trap up uh i haven't personally seen anybody get shot doesn't happen all that frequently but uh <laughs> they stopped I, letting I new yorkers uh, up there a long time ago so that's why no <laughs> one's touching those buoys but it's basically yeah. the the rule of thumb is never touch a buoy in maine right don't don't go near anybody's yeah. buoys because yeah, the buoys represent property right that that buoy mm -hmm. represents a place in the world where that lobsterman gets to fish and no one else does is that right it's yeah i mean it's their livelihood whatever's in that trap you know they're taking the risk they're buying the bait buying the fuel putting that trap out there yeah and can you show us the trap you have one i see in your kitchen can I you have pick a very that up and old show it to school us? trap so this yeah, isn't that's exactly okay. what they look like anymore okay but this but is what they look something like that like, uh, maybe uh maybe a, a, a few decades ago uh, these days they're built more out of uh, out of metal wire and they're square and mm -hmm. there's basically entry points where a lobster comes in snacks on the bait um, they can get out but they tend to actually back themselves through this netting into a chamber that's even harder to get out of and and that's how we catch them but a lot of them do come in eat the bait and leave so in a sense we're we're kind of farming that population especially the little ones that come in, have a snack, leave. And then, you know, we hope we catch them in a few years when they're of legal size. All right. So let's get, a, let's get a few lobster basics uh, under our belts. Uh, when you say legal size, you're talking about what, what weight is a legal size and what dimension? It's actually based off of measuring the lobster's mm -hmm. body shell from yep. the eye mm -hmm. socket down to the waist. Right. And um, there's a tool that you guys use, right? Yep, there's a metal gauge tool, and they have to be at least three and a quarter inches long on that dimension to show that they're, they're old enough that they've had a chance to breed at least once. But then there's you know, the other side of the gauge is five inches, and if they're bigger than that, you have to throw them back also because those are the super breeders. Once they get that big, they right. can really generate lots of eggs. So it's only within that window between three and a quarter and five inches in uh, – body shell length they call it the carapace and, and how old um, is the lobster that's that's that old is it a year eight years old there's a lot of numbers being thrown out all the time about how long it takes for a lobster to get to the one pound minimum size it can take six to seven years wow to grow the shell six that to large. seven years that's incredible so that's why it's so important that you leave a, a lobster in the water if it's underneath the, that minimum size six to seven yeah. years absolutely really incredible 
So when we catch a 10 pound lobster, how many years is that lobster? How old is that? Oh lobster? man, a 10 pound lobster. First of all, you wouldn't be able to keep that in Maine. You, you could keep that right. in Canada, maybe okay. in Massachusetts, but yeah. in Maine, that would be over the max size limit. I mean, to get 10 pounds, I can't even imagine decades. Uh, Gotta be to, to yeah, get 20 to 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys are watching on social and you, and you see people who are handling super large lobsters, sometimes you, you'll see that on social and they'll be in a tank in a restaurant in New York City. Encourage them to send it back. Don't eat it. Yeah. Don't rush out and eat it. But even a three pound lobster is, is cl close to 20 years. Is that right? Chef? Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. Or co-founder Ben. Do you prefer yeah. to be called Ben co-founder or chef? You can you can call me whatever you want to. I I don't like to pretend that I'm a classically trained chef or spent time in uh, in the nicer kitchens of the world. So after but, you've you know, made a million lobster rolls, I think you're good. I think you qualify. Take it from one chef to another. Um, so Ben is not only the co-founder, but I believe you're also chief innovation officer. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I've, that's I mean, I've cool worn title. a lot of hats in this yeah. business, but basically what I get to do now is focus on the issues that are approaching the fishery, whether that's climate change, it's bringing diversity and inclusion to the fishery, or it's just looking at how we can evolve our brand and evolve our product over time. And, you know, I get to focus on kind of getting to look around the corner and seeing where, where Luke should be in a couple of years and helping to get us there. All right. So a couple of things that we're obsessed with are uh, some, some more terms like chicks and culls. Can you can you tell us what the difference between those are? When we're so shopping a, for lobsters, we're always facing these choices. Yeah. So chicks is just going to be the littlest size, like the, the smallest ones that are legal to keep. Um, I think those are a pound and a quarter now in New York. Those are the minimum size for a chick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and those are usually then, the best deal in New York. I don't know how you do it in Maine. We'll get to lobster buying hacks later. You're going to have to tell us how we can spend less money on lobsters later. Yeah. So, so then the culls are, are when they've lost a, lost a claw. Um, and basically that it becomes less valuable in the live market. Uh, yeah. Those calls usually get sent to, to lobster processors. Got it. And if you can buy them live in New York or wherever you are watching from, typically they're 20 to 30 percent less per pound. Of course, you, you you won't get one two claws per lobster, but it's usually, you know, you're still paying for lobster meat. And, and in fact, I think the, the ratio of usable meat in a lobster with one less claw is going to be a little bit higher because most of the meat is in the tail. Am I wrong? Am I wrong, uh, Ben? Is that is that? That, uh... that is where the, the, the largest amount of meat is in the tail. And you know, I would argue yeah. that the, the best meat is in those knuckles and claws, but the, yes. The so most let's, meat you can let's get, talk yeah. about that. You guys don't use tails for lobster rolls. We don't put tails in lobster rolls. Um, we find that tail meat is a little chewier. And when you try to bite into a lobster roll and you have both your, your knuckle claw and your tail, and you have a hard time kind of ripping that tail apart and then you're chewing and chewing. We like to take the tail. We like to put it on the grill or under the broiler or steam it separately and kind of eat it with a fork and knife. Um, for the lobster rolls, we use the knuckle and claw meat because it's the most tender. And when you're biting into that soft pillowy bun, you want to be able to kind of bite right through that lobster and not have something that you're really gnawing on. All right, one more question, then we'll start making some lobster rolls. Uh, you know, I say this every time, I don't have any in front of me, unfortunately. So I'm gonna have to taste test visually only. On the next episode, we'll we'll fix this. But if you got if you if you want to send me an emergency lobster roll, I'll get you my address. What what bait do you use for the lobster and lobster tanks? So there are a lot of opinions on this, and there's a lot of options for this. So the two most popular baits are herring and pogies, which is another word for menhaden. Uh, so those are fish that the lobstermen can actually go out and catch themselves or that some of the, some larger fishing boats go out and catch for bait in the area. But there's also a lot of other bait options that involve taking byproduct from fish that's caught for human consumption. So redfish heads, tuna heads, um, those parts that aren't eaten by humans can get repurposed as bait, which is a really neat thing. We've also started getting some invasive carp out of some of the rivers in the Midwest where they're destroying the population, destroying the ecosystem in some of those Midwestern rivers, fishing those out and using those as lobster bait to give the fishermen in the Midwest an incentive to go fish them because people don't want to eat them. So uh, lots of good ways to get bait from various sources. Very cool. Now, uh, I do know that Maine is, is famous for another delicious food item famous for many things, but blueberries are certainly one of your uh, most lauded uh, products. And, and we're in peak season 
right now or maybe just passed. You can clarify that for me. And I know we're about to make a blueberry crisp and it looks delicious. I can see it on the table in front of you. I'm, I'm curious to see how you make it. Awesome. Yeah. So again, just as important as starting your lobster roll with the best possible lobster meat, you got to start your blueberry crisp with the best possible blueberries. And as you said, right now we're in season for Maine wild low bush blueberries. So if you can see this right here, um, these are about a quarter the size of a blueberry that you might get in across the river in New Jersey. Uh, they're a little bit more tart. They're actually a lot higher in nutrients, so they're healthier for you. And they're you know, my second biggest obsession after lobster. Um, so what we're going to do is make a blueberry crisp. And just like that lobster roll, it's all about featuring the blueberries, making sure you can taste them. Um, so we're starting with a few cups of these wild main blueberries. Um, we're going to dump them into our vessel here. I know the recipe that's sent out um, says to put it in an eight by 11 pan. That's fine too. This is a nine by nine uh, pie tin. Yeah, let's just establish that the size of the pan really doesn't matter. We, we uh, in yeah. recipe writing, we obsess about these pan sizes, but if it's a pan that's low and is made of ceramic or metal, it'll work. Yeah, absolutely. Can we get close and, in on those blueberries so we can just uh, get a gander at a real live main blueberry? Oh, wow. They really do look different. They're very different in yeah. size, huh? Yeah, yeah. These are, these are tiny, tiny little berries. So you really and would you call those huckleberries, or are they totally different? Uh, I think a huckleberry is totally different, but I don't okay. actually know yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, what yeah. a huckleberry is. I've I'll been admit. a chef for 30, 30 years plus, and I still can't tell the difference, but I, I know that they come from Maine, and they're both delicious. Got it. Cool. So uh, we have our berries here. We're going to mix these with some sugar and some orange zest. So I'm going to just pop these in here. Give them a little Sounds stir. Good. It's not, doesn't look like too much sugar. I'm surprised at the quantity. It's much less than I would have expected. Yeah, I mean, so there's going to be more sugar. It's coming. Uh, it's going to come in the top. Oh, yeah? Okay, crisp. got it. Um, but this is just to bring out a little sweetness in these berries. Because as uh -huh. I said, they're, they are a little bit more tart than mm -hmm. blueberries you might be used to if you haven't had wild man blueberries before. So we're going to get that mixed up. And then... What we're gonna do is take some fresh squeezed orange juice. Yum. We're gonna create a slurry with a little bit of cornstarch here. It's just gonna help keep that from getting too juicy when it cooks. So I'm just gonna use a whisk to mix this together, slurry it up a little bit. And I'm just gonna pour this over top. Get that kind of evenly distributed here. Got it. And that, that cornstarch slurry is going to be how the blueberries are held together, right? That and some yeah. of the natural pectin. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we'll get this mixed up a tiny bit more, and then we're going to make our topping. So this Terrific. topping, topping is a mixture of oats, Yum. Some flour, a couple mm -hmm. different types of sugar, a little bit of salt and some very cold butter right out of the refrigerator. So cold butter, okay, got it. Cold butter, yeah. So we're gonna mix all these dry ingredients together. We got our oats, brown sugar, white sugar. There's that sugar you were waiting for. Flour, salt. Give this guy a quick mix. And then I'm going to grab that butter right out of the fridge. Yep. And the butter being cold is an important detail, guys. I know you probably hear this a lot whenever making uh, pie doughs or pie crusts. Uh, if the butter is not cold, it can start to melt. And if it melts, you end up separating the butter fat from the, the whey and the milk solids and you don't get the same crispy flaky result. Exactly right. So this is cubed and then we put it back in the refrigerator. So I know your recipe talks about using different kinds of mixers. I'm a hand tools guy. So I like to yeah. use just a pastry blender here. 
And that's the best way to do it. Unless you're making, you know, a hundred pies that, that you're doing it the best way there is. So basically you're just going to mess with this stuff and get it all blended together until it comes to basically like a, a pea sized crumbly texture. Um, and that's just going to take a minute here, but that is then going to just get spread over top of your blueberries and stick it right in the oven at 350. Um, it's one of the simplest dessert recipes out there. And just like everything else we do, it really just relies on using the best ingredients. You use the best ingredients, you make a simple thing, and then you eat it and you taste all those ingredients. And that's, I mean, that's the beauty of it. I know like sometimes my wife will come home with beautiful berries from the farmer's market and then she'll want to make a dessert and she'll want to go like to the supermarket and get lesser berries because she wants to eat the farmer's market berries straight. I think there's nothing wrong with using the best ingredients, even in your baked goods. You don't need, don't need to go get lesser stuff. Uh, if, it's, if it's good enough for your baked goods, then it should be good enough to eat straight too. So just over invest if you ever have the chance to get some uh, wild man blueberries. They freeze really well. Grab a few pounds. Use them while they're fresh as you can. Put the rest in the freezer. Pop them out later. You can be making main blueberry muffins in the middle of winter time. I I, uh, I don't know if people have seen the way these are picked, but you you said these were low bush blueberries, meaning that they're the ones that are harvested using that rake or that blueberry comb. I, That's exactly may, right. May have one of those, but it's pretty cool, guys. If if you haven't seen the process, look it up. People yeah. walk around, and yeah, you can talk about it. Ben, there's a it. there's a lot of great blueberry companies up here. So I recommend if you're if you're trying to get Maine blueberries at the supermarket down in New York, you can go to Whole Foods. You can get them from a company called Wyman's um, that buys a lot of the blueberries in Maine. Um, most of the farms are out in Washington County, which is the furthest down east, which is the word we use to actually refer to the kind of northeast coastal area of Maine. So um, that's a good place to get them. Uh, if you're up here, there's some great farms. There's a farm called Josh Pond. And I just, I have to just recommend their Instagram account if you want to see what hand raking wild Maine blueberries looks like. What, what's Check out the, what's Josh the name again? Pond. Josh, Josh Pond. Okay. Pond probably josh pond farm i don't okay. remember the exact handle but i love Instagram this kind of stuff is, by the way feel free to give us any any people or farmers or producers that you think we would like to look yeah. at and learn from josh they, they pond, have an yeah, amazing josh pond, Instagram Maine, very handle cool. yeah. if you want to learn about wild and blueberries and they also you know this is a great biodiverse farm where they have goats that do the work of weeding for them and then they make goat cheese and it's just, it's very, very cool. cool business. Uh, there's another blueberry farming work up here called Wild, uh, sorry, called Passamaquoddy uh, Blueberry Company. Um, very cool. And so that's one of the indigenous owned companies up here that has, I think the largest blueberry farm in that county. Um, so it's just, just so many good people making this product. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm on right. Josh Pond's Instagram and it looks amazing. It's exactly what I was describing. And these are wild fields that, that are then cultivated or, or are these sort of half-half? They're, they're all wild. You can basically wow. try okay. to create yeah. the conditions for them, but you can't just plant the blueberries. You have to just sort of find them where they are and, and just help to manage the soil healthily and you know keep, keep going what's naturally there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put this topping on here. Just try to spread it evenly over the top it's going to look like a lot but that's going to sort of cook down into the cracks between your berries so it's okay because when it comes out it won't be quite as overwhelming as it looks when it's raw and this is this is crumbled pastry guys so if you're looking at it think oh that doesn't look like you know pastry that would go on top of a pie it's meant to be a crumble it's not supposed to be a rolled out perfectly formed uh pie dough top that you would buy in a store that is correct so we're going to pop this in the oven 
Of course, we're going to need to hear times and temps. Then probably yeah. 350. I'm going to guess 25, 30 minutes. This is actually this actually stays in there for an hour. Oh, okay, so cool. 350, yeah. 350 right. for an hour um, helps it cook up and and you know develop that cohesion with the pectin, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and the cornstarch. So we're gonna we're gonna set that and forget it right now because I think we'll have said goodbye by the time that's done. But um, through the magic of Zoom, this magic is your of swap finished outs. product. Yeah, got it. <laughs> yeah. That looks amazing. Let's get a close up on that. Let's get a close up. But we want to see people. People are asking. Susan is actually asking, why do you use orange juice and orange zest instead of lemon juice and lemon zest? Like other crisp recipes. Any thoughts? I, I, yeah, I mean, the, so because we're using these wild main blueberries and again, they're so much more tart than a typical blueberry. The orange is less tart than the lemon. Mm. So if you just think about finding that balance in the middle, with a typical blueberry that's going to be sweeter, a lemon might go well, or with a, you know, with a strawberry that's, that's sweeter. With this, because it's going to be more tart, going with something that's not quite as, as bitter with the orange kind of makes, makes a little more sense. That makes so much sense. So, Susan, I hope that answers your question. You know, a lot of cooking is reacting to your environment and your ingredients and what you have in front of you. Um, there are rules and there are, you know, rules of thumb and measurements and ratios, but if you can't taste and react, then, you know, you're, you're going to probably end up with inconsistent results. Uh, Chef Ben is saying the blueberries are more tart up there. So, you know, they're going to need a little more sweetness. And one way to get that done is using the orange juice. Are you going to have a bite so that we can enjoy it vicariously? Um, it looks maybe real maybe good. I might do at, at the end when we got our lobster. All right, okay. Our Let's get to the lobster. We don't want to run out of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so quick before the before the lobster roll, we're just going to make a little bit of slaw here. Um, okay. I'm not going to. I'm not very gonna ambitious knock. menu, chef. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm not going to knock a mayo slaw. I like all kinds of slaws, but at Luke's we make a mayo list slaw. We actually do a lemon toffee seed vinaigrette. Oh, that, that sounds amazing. So I'm just going to finish up slicing a little bit of cabbage here. We're using both green and red cabbage, blend of that, and then some shredded um, carrots. And again, because I'm, I'm weird about the hand tools, like if I'm not doing a ton of this, I prefer to use a knife to a mandolin or anything like that. Just, I just enjoy slicing stuff. So, so to, to that point, Chef Ellen Weiss wants to know what tool you would recommend if they didn't have a pastry blender. That she says it's hard to do by hand. What what do you recommend uh, to to get yeah. your pastry pastry together? So it depends what you've got. If you got a hand mixer, you can definitely just use a hand mixer on pretty low speed. If you got a stand mixer, one of the big kitchen aids, you can use that. Oh um, yeah, there you go. So a, a bowl mixer, just like you'd make any flour, any dough. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Pad paddle then, or whisk? Um, I would I would say paddle. Okay, cool. There you go. Great. But, great. Um, and then right. Sandra, Sandra T wants to know if you guys ship the blueberries out of state. So I guess Josh Pond would be the the source. Do they ship out of state? Josh Pond does ship out of state. Terrific. If you want to order something right offline. Great or news. I'm not sure which regions of Whole Foods have uh wyman's berries in them but a lot of them do i know new york does so you can probably pop down to your your local whole foods and, and get wyman's there all right so we got our veggies mixed here and we're just gonna whip together a quick dressing And we also have we also have local berries in New York State. I know they're not Maine, and I don't think they're as good, but they're they're definitely delicious. There we've got yeah. local farmers out there farming blueberries, and some of them have wild blueberry bushes. Uh, you'll see them at the local farmers market. Uh, some of them call them huckleberries. I'm not sure why, but they sound cute and they're delicious. They taste just like wild Maine blueberries to me. Yeah, and if you go hiking and like I know I've on Bear Mountain, um, not far outside the city, I found wild blueberries in July, uh, and just just bring an empty water bottle and fill them up, and those those are going to very closely resemble those main blueberries. So, what I'm doing here is just mixing some vinegar, some Dijon mustard, and a little bit of sugar. 
And then I'm gonna slowly whisk in a little bit of sunflower oil. And just doing this in a slow drizzle to get it emulsified and nice and creamy. And again, this, this really, you know, if you're not, if you're not using mayo, getting a proper emulsification is going to like make this creamy enough to actually adhere to your vegetables. Whereas if you just dump your oil and your vinegar together and shake it up, it's going to separate and it's not going to really coat the shredded cabbage and carrots well enough. Yeah. So, and you know what, Ben, it's important for people to realize that mayo is indeed another vinaigrette emulsified to the point where it's creamy. It's no different than the vinaigrette you're making. You know, it has eggs to help create that emulsification, but basically it's a mixture of vinegar and oil that's just blended until it's super creamy and uh, emulsified. Exactly right. So at this point, I'm gonna add the poppy seeds as well as a little bit of fresh ground pepper and a little salt. I like to use mold and salt flakes when available. Mix this up a little bit, give it a taste. Perfect. That's so nice and tangy. And then I'm just gonna bring back my veggies here. Pop this in. I love you that you're using the to... salad paddles, by the way. Making the yeah. salad paddles <laughs> a thing again in 2022. Heck yeah. And you do want to do this, you know, a little bit before, you, not right before you eat it, because you want to give time for the salt in that dressing to let your veggies wilt a little bit and soak in some of that dressing. Oh, that's great. Let's look in there. That looks great. Terrific. So this is not not a really wet slaw, huh? It's, uh, it's dry and no. crispy and yeah. It's really nice and crispy, but it will, you know, it will, uh, will wilt a tiny bit right, as right. it sits in this dressing. So it's just, just enough to, to soak it up and be a nice spoonable thing to go right alongside your lobster roll. Um, so yeah, without further ado, we'll get on to our main course here. For sure. And do you like to serve a slaw with a lobster roll as, you know, de rigueur? Is that sort of, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, we do. It's a, you know, it's a standard side for us, really like a handful of chips and a little bit of slaw is, uh, is, is our favorite thing. Um, I don't know if you know so, them, but you have a, you have a magical elf in your kitchen, slowly taking things away. But <laughs> yeah, <I really laughs> there are things that are those. moving without human, human assistance in your kitchen. Yeah, yeah. You just, um, you know, Google magical kitchen elf. Uh, <laughs> they can't recommend more highly um cool where are you so, located in portland eva heineman who's a regular viewer wants to know where luke's is and is located in portland luke's is at 60 portland pier so if you go down cool. to commercial street and you hit portland pier which is the same pier that jay's is on between the, the Milos pier and um where harbor fish is okay uh, it's that middle wharf and it's all the way down at the end right out in the middle of the harbor we actually Amazing. buy from the fishermen wow. that dock right there so we run a buy station a tank room, and then we have our restaurant there at the end. Very cool. All right. So we're going to need to zoom on this one for sure. This is, of course, the only thing that really matters in this entire Wow, there we demonstration. go. The That's it. That's our knuckle and claw meat. Don't move. Hold on. I need, a, I, need a, I need a screenshot of that. <laughs> wow. This lobster came from the co-op on oh. Little Cranberry Island. So if anybody's been out to Bar Harbor area, Cranberry Island is just off Mount Desert Island. And um, these are incredible folks. Their co-op is 110% solar powered with uh, solar panels on the roof of their pie station. Uh, they do amazing work. They handle their lobsters very delicately. So when they get down to us in Saco, they're super strong. Um, and we make this beautiful lobster meat uh, as a result, which we then turn around and send down to financial district to make lobster rolls, or in this case, to my kitchen. So what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is take a couple of these split top New England buns. Um, 
so this is the classic New England lobster roll bun. All right, give us give us the full four one one on that. Yeah. So what you want here is you don't want something that's super thick, bready, or sweet because again you don't want to cover up the flavor of the lobster. So what this basically is is white bread. Um, and it's similar to a typical hot dog bun you might find in the supermarket, except that it sits upright, the opening is on top, and the sides are shaved off. And that becomes key when you go to butter the sides and griddle them up. Because what you want to achieve is a nice buttery toast on the outside of that bun. So I have some butter right here that is melted and ready to go. And I'm just using a pastry brush to get that melted butter on the sides of the bun. And don't be shy with the butter on there. And I have a griddle here that's heated up and ready to toast. I'm gonna make a couple of uh, couple lobster rolls here. So we'll do this again. So if you needed to use a piece of white bread, you know, sort of like a Wonder Bread style of white bread, would that work fine? Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're choosing between two pieces of white bread or one piece of white bread and a hot dog bun that doesn't have the sides shaved off, go ahead and use the white bread because you can get yeah. this uh, you can get this toast on it. Can also cut off the sides of a hot dog bun. I've done that before. Yep. You can cut it, cut, cut the sides off, and shape it so that it's got that split top look definitely all right so as these are toasting i'm getting ready my next ingredient which is mayonnaise now i really want to address this because a lot of people in new york think that the main style lobster roll is some old frozen lobster meat mixed with about a cup of mayonnaise and some <laughs> celery and chives and, and a bunch of other stuff some of and us think there's butter and lemon <laughs> yeah, that, and so, yeah, celery is a big one. In Maine, what we consider to be a traditional lobster roll is lobster in a bun with very little else. So when we talk about mayonnaise, we're not talking about tossing, we're not talking about a lobster salad. We're talking about spreading a little bit of mayo on the inside of the bun. And I like to say, you know, if you were going to make a steak sandwich with a beautiful medium rare piece of meat you wouldn't take yep. all that meat slice it up toss it with a cup of mayonnaise and put it onto a sandwich you might just spread a little bit of mayonnaise on the bread that's exactly what we do with a lobster roll so we're going to take these off this is that buttery toast that you're trying to achieve looks good so it's just slightly toasted, huh? And it's not not dripping in butter. It's sort of dry, I'd call that it. Butter, that like butter cooks, cooks right in. Um, so it's just you know, it's just like if you're making a grilled cheese. It's about that it. way. So we have our buns here. And I'm just going to take a knife, a little bit of mayo, and just spread it on the insides of these buns. All right, this so is again, probably where most people get confused. So the, the only mayo in this lobster roll is that. Exactly. Just wow. that little bit. Minds are blown right now. I'm sure of it. I'm sure most people are saying that's not enough mayo. And how can you not mix the lobster with the mayo? And why is yeah, it I'll butter? I'll tell you, um, some of the, the most consistent and best feedback we get in the shacks is, you know, I never thought I really loved lobster rolls that much because I always thought they had too much mayonnaise. And then they have ours and they think, oh my gosh, this is what a lobster roll can be when you use the best lobster and you don't cover it up. And that's really, I mean, that's what our whole business is about. That's why we started in the first place because we couldn't find a lobster roll that wasn't drowned in mayo in the city. So here we are, we just have that little bit of mayonnaise and now it's time to pile in this beautiful lobster meat. So, Ah, they got to see that nice and close. Zoom in here. Getting We're getting just... a bowl full of claws and knuckles is so hard to do for most people, but um, you guys have provided a way for us to get that directly from you through Whole Foods, I believe. Is that is that right, Ben? 
You can get it at Whole Foods in the frozen seafood section. So if you go to the seafood counter and you see that where that freezer is just adjacent to the seafood counter, you'll mm -hmm. find our frozen lobster meat there. Or if you're not close to a Whole Foods, you can go online, lukeslobster.com, and you can buy the whole lobster roll kit. You get the knuckle claw meat, you get the buns, you get the secret seasoning, which we're going to put on in a second, and you're ready to go. So, Amazing. Yeah. A lot of people. That's incredible. Wow. Free Luke's. Yeah. They might have had to like steam a whole lobster to get to the point where they could get this knuckle and claw meat out. Now you don't have to. Now you can just go right to the store, right online, have it show up to your house a couple of days later. So, the most important part done. Now we are just looking to drizzle a little bit of lemon butter on top. So, I still have this pot of butter. I'm just going to squeeze a little bit of lemon. You're looking to do about a tablespoon per pound of butter. And now does this lemon butter make it more of a Connecticut style roll? There's some questions about, is this considered a main roll, a hot lobster roll, a Connecticut roll? Can you do, do the math for us? Tell us what we're doing here. Yeah, absolutely. So Laura wants to know. When people say Connecticut roll, the lobster is hot. There's no mayonnaise at all. And then there's hot butter on top. Now, the reason we don't love to do that is folks have taken knuckle and claw meat that's been cooked, been chilled, taken out of the refrigerator and put back in a pot or a pan and recooked. And what happens when you do that is it starts to get chewy and it starts to lose some of its sweetness. Um, and so we don't think that's the best way to treat our precious lobster. So what we do is we take that lobster out of the fridge just a little bit before we serve it so it gets closer up to room temp and we serve it there so it's got that perfect tender texture and that perfect sweetness and then we have both that mayo that you saw going to the bun which mayo do you like to use ben we're getting we lots use, of questions about brands of mayo dukes hellman's we use hellman's in our shacks okay, okay. um but you know Obviously, use what you love, um, what you have on hand. We like to not use something that's super, super flavorful. So like not really sweet, not really tangy. Um, so that's where, despite, you know, whatever our preferences is, preferences are for mayos and other uses, we try to use Hellman because it's a, it's a pretty even flavor. It's not, it's not too sweet. It's not too tangy. So it doesn't take away from the lobster. So we have the lemon butter here. We're going to drizzle it on top. I think that's where uh, some people confuse our role with the Connecticut style role because yum. this part is similar to Connecticut style role, but this is just a, a pretty standard move in Maine. What you'll probably get in Maine is a roll that might have that cup of butter on the side. It'll have chilled lobster in a bun. It'll be up to you to drizzle that lemon butter on top. Um, but that's where I think of as the most common and the highest quality Maine lobster roll is pure lobster in the bun and then minimal accoutrements. And then what we do here is we take this seasoning blend. Um, it's got a few different herbs and some salt and pepper. And we just put a little sprinkling on top. And again, if, if you do too much, you're gonna cover the flavor of the lobster. But if you do just that little bit, then those herbs and spices are just gonna enhance that flavor just enough. So, one thing I always like to point out, if you're getting our kits, either the meat in Whole Foods or the kit online, it comes with a seasoning packet that looks like this. Do not the under any circumstances packet. use all of this seasoning on the four lobster rolls that you're gonna make or the two lobster rolls that you're gonna make. You have plenty of seasoning here for lobster rolls and a ton of other things. Um, so don't take this packet, open it, dump it on the on the roll that'll be way too much seasoning just take a pinch and put a pinch on each on each roll and all this is um, available either at whole foods or lukeslobster.com exactly yeah even diane mccabe is on saying that uh they bought the lobster kit from whole foods they followed the recipe on the box which is exactly what you're doing here today and was absolutely delicious thank you diane for that feedback amazing that's what we like to hear and then Sharon um, Rizzo is saying that your main lobster rolls are better at better than the ones from Massachusetts. Feel like that's a provocation. 
I don't know if we need to go there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take that. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you there. Um, except for the ones in Massachusetts that are served at Luke's Lobster in Boston. Those <laughs> Massachusetts lobster rolls are fantastic. <laughs> Susan wants to know why lemon butter as opposed to butter. Butter without lemon, I guess. We like just that little bit of acid to help with the kind of balance out the, the sweetness and the butteriness of the rest of the dish. Um, it's just helpful in adding a little bit of balance. Very cool. I like it too. I'm always, also, I'm always talking about acidity in cooking and uh, lemon juice and lemon juice and butter, you know, probably the one of the great food combinations of all time. Yeah. And on that note, I'm, I'm drinking an Allagash White, which is a classic main microbrew. And because it's kind of light and citrusy, it goes really well with lobster roll again, because you don't want something heavy or sweet when you're having the sweet lobster and the buttery bun and all that. You want something that'll help you cut through it. And so now, nothing to do with the fact that my wife works for Allagash, only because it's just a great uh, lobster roll. No, we, we get it. Allagash <laughs> is the way to go. So how many Allagash um, until the lobster roll reaches peak flavor? Is it three, four? Um, it's actually right at two and a <laughs> half. So, two and a half. So, so drink two and a half before you, you take your first bite. And you're going to experience. Finish yeah. one before you start cooking. Open one, drink it while you cook. Open another while you're eating, and that's that's sort of your your prime. And then what you do after that is entirely up to you. That sounds good to me. Someone uh, named anonymous attendee. Uh, I didn't know they named their people named their kids anonymous attendee. Says, uh, "What's the ideal amount of time to freeze the lobster for maximum freshness?" I guess they want to know how long can you freeze the lobster um, before it starts to get all funny. This really depends on how you freeze it. And this is, this could be a long conversation. Okay. So right. um, when we freeze lobster, which we do, because there are seasons, namely between like January and April, where very few lobstermen fish and you want to be able to have delicious lobster year round. So in peak season, which lasts right up through November, we're going to buy and cook extra lobster and we're going to freeze it in a liquid nitrogen tunnel. So what that does Whoa. is it takes it, from about 40 degrees Fahrenheit down to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit in under 15 minutes. And when you freeze that quickly, you do nothing to alter the texture of the tissue of that lobster meat. So basically it's, it's all about the size of the ice crystals. If you take lobster and you just put it in your freezer at home, it's gonna create these very large ice crystals throughout the meat. Then when you go to thaw it, those ice crystals are gonna release all that water and it's not going to get reabsorbed into the meat a lot of it is going to flow out into the bowl or whatever container you have it thawing in so the liquid nitrogen in that fast freeze and those small ice crystals is what's key to freeze in a way that it's virtually indistinguishable from a fresh product when you eat it so if you buy our frozen lobster meat you could leave it for a year in your freezer and as long as you thaw it slowly that's the other key when you get our frozen lobster meat you want to put it in the fridge and leave it. Don't touch it. Don't think, oh my gosh, I forgot to take it out of the freezer yesterday and now I got to put it on the counter. I got to run it under water or whatever. You're not going to get the best experience doing that. You got to take it out at least 24 hours in advance, put it in your fridge, give it a little space to breathe and let it go at its own pace. And that is how it reabsorbs all of that water. The faster it thaws, the more that water is going to leach out, you're going to lose it, and then you're going to notice the flavor difference when you eat it. So if you're freezing in your own freezer, I don't recommend it, but if you have excess and that's what you got to do to keep it from spoiling, I would say the sooner you can pull that back out, slow thaw it, and eat it, the better. You know, I tried to get back, try to get back to that in the next few weeks if you can. If you have, if you have excess lobster, you just need to invite more friends over and more neighbors over, and I'm pretty sure you're excess will be eaten up pretty quickly and then the other part of the question yeah. from uh, anonymous is is the seasoning that's sold at whole foods exactly like the ones that you use uh is the secret seasoning exactly the same as the one you use at luke's lobster it is the very same um exact same makeup exact same ingredients. amazing terrific terrific can we see you take a bite we're all dying you know everybody's slobbering here waiting for waiting for a virtual bite <laughs> 
I've been waiting for close you to up ask. on that. <laughs> it looks so, it right. looks overfilled and abundant, and it looks like you have no respect for the bun. Like you just want to want to fill it to the point where the bun is unrecognizable. Everybody just gulped and gasped as they watched you eat that delicious first bite of a lobster roll. And if you haven't had one in a long time, the first bite is really, it's, there's like a, a crescendo of joy and sources, different sources of joy and different parts of your brain being activated all over the yeah. palate, plus the and Allagash what you white. Get, what you should get is, is lobster. If you bite into a lobster roll, and the first thing you taste is anything other than just that sweetness of lobster, you've done something wrong. Rewind, do it over. Um, but that's, again, it all comes down to getting the right lobster, the right ingredients, keeping it simple, and letting that lobster shine. And you'll be happy when you take that first bite. So you, you, you mentioned a couple of things there that are important to identify. Uh, fresh and sweet, and that comes from proper cooking. And we were talking earlier, let, let everybody know how long it takes to cook lobster. I think it's going to be a lot less than most people realize. Yeah, so it depends what you're trying to do with it. If you're trying to cook a whole lobster, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great experience to have friends over, cook whole lobster in a pot. That's awesome. We have instructions for how to figure out how many minutes based on how many lobsters of what size you're putting in the pot. So that's all going to be in YouTube links and blog links that have been sent out or are being sent out to you guys. Um, if you're trying to make lobster rolls and you want to do that starting from scratch with the whole lobster, you don't want to actually cook that whole lobster. Because the issue is if you're going for the perfect meat, for the perfect bite in this roll, you don't want to actually use the tail, right? Because that's too chewy. And you don't want to cook it all together because the parts actually cook at different speeds. So in order to get the tail fully cooked, you might overcook the knuckles and claws, vice versa. So what we actually do is we separate the parts. We cook the knuckles and claws together and we separate the tails and we use those for something else. So what you'll wanna do is separate those knuckles and claws and just steam them in you know, no more than an inch of salted water. If you're by the ocean, use ocean water. Um, and you're only going to need to steam those for about five minutes before they're And he's not done, joking about the ocean fit. water. He not literally means go get ocean water and bring it to a boil. I've seen that in, in quite a few coastal cities, uh, California, Louisiana, Florida, Maine, uh, where they'll actually cook things in, in ocean water. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a real chef hack right there. Uh, if you visit Luke's Lobster on YouTube, there are videos uh, just like this one that will go step by step teach you how to do a lobster bake, steam your lobster, make a lobster roll. Don't forget you can buy the kits. That's what I would do because the lobster is literally fished by Ben's friends in Maine, harvested, processed properly, cooked perfectly, put in a box and shipped to you. It makes a lot of sense to me. I'll be ordering one of those the minute we get off this, Ben. Uh, and uh, don't forget that um, Ben has... Uh, picked a charity that he is intimately involved with and uh, he'd love to tell you about and any proceeds that come from today's um, Zoom will directly benefit his charity of choice. What, 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 tell us about your charity, Chef. Yeah, so we're here to benefit the Barrio Fridge. In fact, that's the t-shirt that I'm wearing right now. Um, and the Barrio Fridge is a really amazing organization based in East Harlem. It is a community fridge where food that might otherwise go to waste, whether it's from restaurants or other sources, gets donated, put in a fridge where folks in the neighborhood can come, take what they need, no questions asked. It's always super safe, very well maintained, and it was founded by two amazing women who saw a need, saw inequality of food access in their neighborhood, and put this together piece by piece. Um, and actually, uh, my great friend and colleague and our uh, co-chair of our diversity and inclusion department at Luke's named Eddie had a personal friendship with one of the founders named Chantel. He's also uh, from Harlem, originally grew up there. Um, and they met and hit it off. And we learned about this organization. And they do amazing work providing food to those in need um, without barriers, without questions, without paperwork, food that would otherwise go to waste 
it's on their table and it's folks who are out there doing the work and making things happen and getting food to those in need that we really want to support. So the Barrio Fridge, thebarriofridge.com, check them out. If you can make a donation, uh, no amount too small, no amount too big. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions about them. Very cool. And uh, also tell us about your book, Ben. Yeah. That's so the book is sale. called... The I book, see it in the, the background. The book is for sale. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that cue. It's called Real Main Food. Um, and I wrote this in 2014. And the impetus was really, if you go to Leeks and Fried Eye, you'll see a very small menu, lobster rolls, crab rolls, shrimp rolls, some soups, some slaw. Um, but there's so much other great food and amazing bounty that Maine has to offer. And so I decided, you know what? This is back when I was living in New York. I'm going to use an excuse to go travel around the state, meet with fishermen, farmers, chefs, um, folks up and down the coast and inland and up in the mountains and way up in Fort Kent in buckwheat country. Uh, I'm going to collect 100 recipes, put those together and get them out to the world. So you'll find not just great lobster recipes, but all sorts of seafood, those wild Maine blueberries, um, great farmed meat and vegetable products, that buckwheat, the potatoes, which actually occupy about three quarters of the, the square mileage of the state of Maine. Um, it's all in here. So you can get this on our website. You do, um, you do need to throw it into an order that's got other things in it because all of our shipments go out overnight with ice packs. And so if you just get the book, you're kind of paying for overnight shipping for nothing. Um, if that doesn't work for you, Rizzoli is the publisher, R-I-Z-Z-O-L-I. -Z -Z you can find the book there. I always hesitate to send anyone to Amazon because um, I like to support local businesses. Uh, but in a pinch, there's always that too. Terrific, Ben, this was really illuminating on so many levels. Just the amount of time it takes to cook lobster properly is basically a masterclass for me. And I've been cooking lobster for a long time. Um, and then the amount of mayo, the bun, all the techniques and the blueberry uh, crisp is, I'm sure is more delicious than it looks. Thank you for sharing all of your secrets. Uh, guys, don't forget to donate to Barrio Fridge to help out Ben's uh, favorite charity. Don't forget to uh, go to Luke's. They're at uh, 26 South William Street in New York City. Of course, there are many other locations across the country and, and internationally. And don't forget to post your plate. Uh, if you recreate this recipe or any of the recipes that you saw today and post it on Instagram and you tag Luke's Lobster, if you tag downtown, you tag us, we'll pick, we'll pick a winner and that person will get uh, a 30-minute cooking class with Ben uh, on Zoom virtually. Uh, people have really enjoyed the cooking classes, by the way, and uh, really enjoyed the whole post your plate um, experience. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening. For those of you who, who have questions still, we will respond, of course, like we always do, and email you all the answers. I think there were a couple of wows and whoopies and yeah, lobster rolls. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Ellen, for, for being here always. And being uh, fans and supporters. And then uh, of course, Dine Around Downtown continues. So stay tuned, there's a holiday episode coming up in December uh, and, and there's more. We've got another in-person event coming up in October. We're excited to invite you to that and tell you more about that. Uh, we, we look forward to, we're calling it the Lunchbox. Uh, I, think, I think we're allowed to talk about it. If, I'm not, if not, someone send me an urgent message in my chat box telling me to stop talking about it. But uh, otherwise, oh, all good. I got the all good, guys. It's called Lunchbox. It's in October. You get to join us downtown and for an in-person food fair. And uh, we'll be selling food that from a curated selection of downtown chefs and restaurateurs for only 10 bucks each. That is a good deal. The food at the last event was out of this world, outrageous and much more delicious than it normally is at these events. So uh, please join us then. As always, it's been fun. Thank you uh, to everyone, Craig, Shelley, Ron at downtown. And thank you to all of uh, you who watch us and support us. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Over and out, guys. Have a good day.